When President Cyril Ramaphosa announced the COVID-19 lockdown in March, he mentioned that certain prominent families would assist in trying to curb the economic blow this would cause. The South African Future Trust, or SAFT, was set up by the Oppenheimer family to provide direct financial relief of one billion rand to employees of qualifying SMMEs against possible income loss as a result of COVID-19. To tell us more about this, we are joined by the executive chairman of Oppenheimer Generations, Jonathan Oppenheimer, to tell us, of course, how it works and uh, all other necessities around it. Great to have you, Jonathan. Thanks so much for talking to us. Leanne, thank you very much for having me on the show. So we understand that the South Africa Future Trust isn't a donation, but rather an interest-free loan. So let's give the details out about it. Well, first thing first, uh, the Oppenheimer family is given, or Nikki and uh, my father and I, have given a billion rand to the South African Future Trust never to come back. The South African Future Trust in and of itself needed to find a very efficient way to get money to SMMEs or more importantly to the employees of SMMEs. And we wanted to use the SMMEs themselves to verify their employees. The, the easiest way to do that was for them to effectively uh, take on a very concessionary uh, loan. It's subordinated to all other debt. It's interest-free for, free for five years. And at the end of the period, it needs to get paid back. Once it's paid back, the South African Future Trust is going to have a long-term development role in South Africa, which will expire at the end of 2040. So, uh, the trust itself is completely ring-fenced. Money that goes into it will be used for development in South Africa until it's exhausted. Mm. And uh, the idea is to address two critical issues. The first critical issue is putting ha money in the hands of people who need to eat. And the second critical issue is mitigating and delaying a cash flow requirement for SMMEs. And I think we achieve both in a very efficient way with our partner banks. Yeah. So, okay, that's, that's, that, that's a great explanation about it. So, you know, some people questioning, you know, that the Oppenheimer family is going to get the money back. But this is not the case. This is now going into a fund that will be not only supporting SMMEs now with giving them interest-free loans. Once COVID-19 is over, and it will be over, it will still be there for other SMMEs to lo take loans from and work in a very, very similar way. Will the interest loan, uh, interest-free loan aspect of it remain, or will, once we get over this time, something change with regard to the interests? I'm afraid we haven't thought through the development role as fully as we have uh, how we transfer money to needy people in the SMME space. That was the first priority. Yeah. Uh, the reality is it will become a development agency of some sort. It may lend, it may support training, it may provide underlying infrastructure. Who knows? All of that will be governed by the fact that it is a PBO, a public benefit organization, and uh, it will need to jump through any legal hoops that it needs to to pursue different development strategies in the long term. So when we talk about people that or organizations that qualify for this loan that we're talking to now, who are we looking at? Is it any SMME or, or, or what are you looking for particularly? We were asked to set a series of criteria and uh, in partnership with the banks and we've partnered now with six banks. Uh, ABSA, Standard Bank, Nedbank, FMB, Mercantile, and Investec. And the banks act as our agent. And when we talked to them, they said the most needy, the most likely to fall through any safety net that already existed, set up by government, for example, UIF and the likes, were companies with a turnover less than 25 million rand. And so we have a threshold of businesses that can apply need to have at least a 25 million rand, sorry, need to have a turnover less than less 25 than. million rand to apply. Okay, so less than 25 million to apply. Is the fund still open? Um, is it still uh, still paying out loans at this point in time? I've heard some people saying, you know, it's, it's, it's already uh, had reached capacity of applic applications. 
So we've been very clear with all our uh, agents, the banks themselves, and the banks in turn have been very clear with uh, all the, the their clients. Our approach has been, on a first-come, first-serve basis, we will extend uh, approved loan agreements. If you haven't signed your loan agreement as the SMME and the money becomes exhausted, then it's... Uh, very sad and, and unlucky. Uh, in an ideal world, of course, we would have lots of money and we could continue to do this. So where do we sit right now? The banks themselves have authorized um, applications to the tune of about 750, 800 million rand. Those were the figures as of sort of 10 p.m. last night, and they keep on going up. Yeah. Uh, of that, 400 million Rand or a little bit more than that has been uh, taken up by SMMEs. Mm. So the SMMEs have actually taken 400 million rands worth of the billion, uh, actually it's slightly more than a billion rand because we've been raising some funds. And uh, right now, as we sit 29th of April, we have about 1.12 billion rand in the fund. And... Uh, as I say, about 800 million, 750 to 800 million rand committed and uh, over 400 million rand signed up. And that, it, what, what we're seeing is that the acceleration of approvals is increasing. Yeah, yeah, sure. And also, I mean, according to your website, we see that 5,700 businesses encompassing 69,000 employees have already applied. I don't know if that number has grown. That's correct. That's, that's, that's the number we're looking Again, at. That, that number was of early yesterday. Yeah. Uh, the, I think in the website, unless it's been updated, I haven't looked this morning, it was at about 670 million rand approved. Yeah. I also saw... Uh, the, uh, I, sorry, that's gone please, up. Please carry on. No, you were saying... No, no, go on, go on. So I'm also seeing that there, there was also another loan that was made uh, into this, not a loan, but a, a, a donation from um, Michelle Leroux, one of the founding directors Correct. of Capitec Bank. So uh, when you mentioned the $1.1 I, uh, I imagine that's obviously been included into it. So that's also been... Uh, so it's been expanded. It's even made a little bit more money available. Exactly. We, we've... Uh, my father and I have been sort of ringing around <clears throat> and calling people who we feel would, one, be patriotic South Africans who, and people interested in the success of South Africa, and been showing them that this is an incredibly efficient mechanism to get money to some of the most vulnerable. Yeah. And again, just to emphasize, particularly at the small end of the SMME space, the sole trader space, a lot of these people aren't, sadly, properly registered to access things like UIF and the likes. Mm, mm. I mean, it's great if they can. Our mechanism doesn't demand that they be fully registered. Yeah. Just that the SMME is prepared to register the individual and is prepared to take on the obligation to pay that back that money over a five-year interest-free period. Jonathan, I want to talk a little bit more about in terms of what South Africa will look, look like after this, the lockdown. Even before we entered into lockdown, the economy was on a, 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 on a, on a downward spiral, to put it that way. And now, of course, it has been accelerated. It's like a, a roller coaster ride down. Further restrictions or lockdowns that do come our way, obviously, we're going to see more and more businesses closing down, people losing their jobs. You know, as major investors in the country, both here and around the world, what, what are your fears? I mean, what, what do you think it's going to look like after this? <laughs> if, I, if I had that crystal ball, I would be a very, very successful and wealthy person. Uh, the, the reality is there is going to be a new normal. What that new normal looks like, I think, is the billion-dollar question everyone's asking themselves. There are some businesses that will do better out of this. You think that uh, potentially medical space should prosper. Uh, there will be others which demand social interactions, which in all likelihood will do worse. Uh, to try and predict with so many different variables and moving pieces right now would would be 
uh, I, all I know is I'll be wrong. Mm, mm, I think I think that's what's it's it's proving every prediction wrong at this point in time, except for that it is having a dramatic effect around the world. It's also going to have a dramatic effect on some of the the, the businesses that are taking loans from you. I mean, let's talk to that situation if they do take a loan, as you say, it is a loan, it's an interest-free loan that has to be paid back over five years. What happens if their businesses can't pay that loan back? What happens then? Well, uh, I suspect that many of their other borrowings will be uh, more difficult for them to repay. Uh, if there's a business that can survive and not pay us back over five years, five years hence, I think there's a conversation to be had if they can't pay us back the full amount to to look at uh, extending that, but extending it most probably with some sort of interest charge. Mm -hmm. But we haven't even contemplated what that would look like beyond 2025. Yeah. I mean, one thing we're realizing is that, you know, things are announced and then uh, things change so much after an announcement that obviously it, it's constantly the components of everything are changing all of the time. And I would imagine that this is no different. Um, when you met with the president, and, and if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, we understand that the president had meetings with different um, investors and business leaders prior to announcing the lockdown, as you mentioned in the interview. How did this proposal come about of, of SAFT and, and also how the trust is actually <coughs> administered separately? So uh, that's an that's a interesting way of looking at it. Uh, I, neither my father nor myself had a direct conversation with the president about SAFT in its idea before we had committed to do something. Uh, what was interesting is my children, my father, myself, got together sort of mid-March and said, hang on, there's a real need to do something here. What can we do? And as we thought about it, we uh, felt that the existing channels, whether it was social grant money, whether it's NGOs, whether it was community community-based organizations, uh, all could be capacitated and people could put more money into them to support them to continue to reach out to these vulnerable people. The people who were previously not vulnerable and were becoming vulnerable because they were losing their jobs uh, would find it incredibly difficult to get into those networks. And if we had to not only continue to support the existing people in those networks, but maybe another million people plus their dependents into those systems, we would overload them and break them. Mm. And so it became pretty self-evident that actually the SMME sector is one of our most vulnerable areas. They are very cash flow dependent. Their cash flows were drying up. The single largest cash flow item for most SMMEs is their employee base. And we felt that by creating SAF the way we could, we could create a super efficient mechanism to get money to the employees with a minimal burden on the SMME, the interest-free over five years. Uh, using that mechanism to effectively minimize the amount of abuse in the system, we got the banks on board and we went from idea to paying out money in less than 20 days. I think it was 16 days in the end. Mm, 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 mm. Well, I mean, you know, this is, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a vital way to keep businesses afloat. But, you know, some people at the, you know, onset of, of this were always asking the question, why mining? Why is mining seen as essential? And asking very critical questions with regard to, you know, how things were working differently. From your perspective on all of this, what, what, what would you answer? I mean, how, how do we explain mining as an essential service and everything else being shut down? Well, Leanna, firstly, as a family, we, we've, at some level, very heart sore, no longer in the mining business. Uh, but so being able to talk with real authority of current day information to that, I can't. 
Mm. However, at a macro level, mining is a vital and integral part of keeping the South African economy operating. It is one of the biggest consumers of South African service, um, services. It is an enormous generator of foreign currency reserves. It creates a lot of essential products for, for not only South African industry, but for the world. And on that basis, I think that keeping mining going is really important. Mm. What mm. I do know is open cast mining, it's relatively easy. So, uh, so above ground mining, re relatively easy to socially distance. Uh, underground, that's a different matter, and it seems to me that the South African government has taken those sorts of considerations into into uh, effect as they've thought about how to open the market. Yeah, yeah. Just finally, Jonathan, as I, I, I sort of wrap up the interview with you, a lot of people say that this is a time for South Africa to reset its economy. The president has spoken a lot to this new economy that we can look forward to that you know out of difficult times and pandemics such as this there are changes that are going to take place some of them good and obviously we're seeing the bad emerging out of this but if we have to look at the economy of South Africa going forward and taking some lessons out of this and perhaps looking at some positives for it what do you believe South Africa can leverage off at a time like this I think that South Africa can leverage a cooperative environment between the state as the regulator and uh, private capital and state capital as the operator, but very much seen as a standalone independent operating entities. And the the, the amazing thing, the real benefits out of, or not benefits, positives out of uh, COVID, if you're looking for a silver lining, has been the extraordinary cooperation, certainly that we experienced when we set up SAFT, the South African Future Trust. Uh, yeah, government worked alongside us to make things happen in a timeline which was truly extraordinary. Now, if that could be the new normal, where government and business were cooperatively working together to create jobs, to create growth, I think we really could become an extraordinary nation. When we feel like we're in conflict with one another, then uh, and insist on trying to regulate and fight one another at every turn, that's where the real problems start. And the crisis of COVID really highlights the need to to be cooperative not conflictual uh, and i i think that's going to happen i it it kind of has to happen we leave it there for this morning. Jonathan, thank you so much for your time. Jonathan Oppenheimer is the executive chairman of Oppenheimer Generations, talking to us about their family's South Africa Future Trust that's set up to help cushion the economic impact of the COVID-19 lockdown on SMMEs. The family made, of course, the de initial donation of a billion rand. And for those asking, that was money that they donated. They're not getting it back. It's a fund that is going to exist past coronavirus where people and businesses are able to apply for loans from there to repay. All right.